Doug White from Model Car Muse. I'm here with a very special friend. I have known since I've been coming to NNL East. I met him at my first NNL East. He's an amazingly creative guy. He was one of the first guys that showed me dioramas and his passion for building model cars. This is Joel Neperstack, but that goes way back for you in your family's history. Yeah, it does. My older brother is four years older than me, and it was around 1956, actually, when the first Ravel Gowland Pioneer, Highway Pioneers or something, 132nd scale, came out. And uh, me and my brother started modifying them. We saw some things in Rod and Custom Magazine at the time. They had a contest, which we didn't get into, but we were building way back then. And that's something that stuck with me, 132nd scale. Your family was also you, they were into racing. My dad was a gearhead from way back. He was into motorcycles, he was into boats, he built a small cabin cruiser boat of his own, all kinds of things like that. Raced the midget at Nutley Velodrome, which was a dangerous place in the late 30s. So we grew up with all that stuff. You know, he bought me and my brother helmets when we were in grade school. <laughs> That's <laughs> telling you something, you know? <laughs> So, yeah, it's been my family history, and uh, we've been involved in all kinds of things like that. Racing and mainly cars, four wheels. It was a great time to be, too. Late 50s, 60s, all through that era, it was a terrific time to be involved. You had that super creative side. My dad was creative in whatever he built. He never really bought things. Childhood depression, he built everything. But that was his creative end of things. But my mom was really the creative push artistically with things. She was always drawing and painting and had us doing it as kids. Just kind of a natural thing that we combined everything. Was that what influenced you to become an illustrator, a commercial illustrator? Yeah, well, that was a kind of an odd route. I got out of high school in 1966, and that was the summer of love, where everybody dropped out and tuned in. And I did that also and worked a number of jobs until my wife said, you've got to do something with your talent. So my mother and my ex-wife convinced me to go to visual arts, School of Visual Arts. SVA. Changed yeah. everything the very first day. I just, you know, went to SVA, first day knew I was going to be an artist, knew, and just said, okay, I'm just going to draw and paint pictures. I didn't even think about working a job for anybody or at any place. It was always freelance. And eventually you came back around and taught at SVA. Yeah, SVA and a comic book school out here in New Jersey. And teaching was another thing that I never thought that I would be doing. But I was asked to do it and it just, it made me a better artist being able to, and you probably know, if you can impart what you know on other people, you get so much back from that. And then having to explain into words what you do automatically, it's just incredible. You don't realize that you maybe knew so much, you know, and it was a great thing. Well, that was like at the first NNL I went to, where I met you. Yeah. And you were there and you had a diorama, 57 Ford. You remember that? <laughs> oh, Gee. man, do I. <laughs> Because it, it was the first time I had ever seen a diorama that was automotive in yeah. content and it had all that action. I mean, it was like everything anyone would put into a painting, you know, all those clues of like what is motion and what's happening here. You had that all in the diorama of this. It was a dirt track mm. and the car was, who was the driver? Uh, it was a fictional car. I couldn't find reference material of 57 Ford uh, convertible racers at that time. Mm -hmm. That was before the internet and everything. So I just kind of made one up, looking at photographs of them. But you know, again, I didn't have a, enough photographs to build a replica, which you know is necessary to have all that material yeah. and research. So I made it up. The reason for doing that whole diorama and everything was to photograph it. Mm -hmm. I had okay. gotten into model railroading and there was a fellow who did an article in one of the model railroad magazines about pinhole cameras. So you get great depth of field. You know much more about this yeah. than I do. And I just wanted to try that out and take some photographs. So that was the basis of that 12 by 12, give or take, diorama. And building the model to try and get it realistic looking so that I could photograph it and get that feel. It was so cool, and I just, I still remember your description and telling me about it. Tell you, I mean, the dirt in the car is drifting, and about the guardrail, and there was some signage, yeah. and how important all that was in there. Yeah. And I'm like, 
That's what a diorama is. It's yeah. just an amazing story. Yeah. Well, I can't take credit for dioramas. They were around for long, especially in model railroading. But yeah, but it was so cool. Thank you. It just Thank blew you. me away. So you've been you've been coming to NNL fairly regularly, some on and off. Yeah, I what, the what is years, what is what does it mean to you when you when you come here? I mean, oh, it's you know, is terrific. It's a veteran. Well, you know, like all modelers, I still have stuff. <laughs> And one of these days, I'm, I'm never going to quit drawing and painting. And getting paid for it is part of it. So you can still call yourself a professional. But I have two models planned, and I bought all the materials for them, all the stuff. It's just finding the time to do them. You know, one thirty-second scale track roads. There's two replicas of California cars. One with a flathead Ford, and one with a GMC six in it. It's like just the two variations that I want to do. It's gonna be so cool. I can't wait yeah. to see those. Maybe another diorama, I don't know. <laughs> you're still working on models on and off, you're doing illustrations, you're just always immersed in creativity. Yeah. But you went to work for another company in New York and did some really cool stuff Thank there. You. Thank you. Yeah, well, when I was getting divorced and freelance work at the time illustration was changing and it's changing again. Freelance wasn't paying the bills and so forth. And I saw an ad and I got lucky to get a job at Macy's Parade Studio as one of the artist designers designing parade floats, balloons, and whatever else that they did. And it was a great job, terrific job. You got to stay in the city, be around creative people. Oh, it was you wonderful. Have, would you have like one, one deadline a year? No, like, yeah. no, no, no. We <laughs> say, they say, you just gotta get ready for the parade. No. No, actually, there was a whole bunch of stuff. There yeah. was uh, the flower show that Macy's put on at 34th Street. Oh, yeah. We'd built props and so forth. We'd yeah. set a whole scene thing. Then there was balloon design, float design, and other Macy's events that we did things for. And believe it or not, that goes on all year. There's a studio down in Moonaki, New Jersey, where they're doing it now. It's all computer-generated art, not hand-done like I used to do. but. Uh, throughout the year, they're working on this thing year-round. In working on that, was there a different mindset design-wise? It all came down to basic art and creativity, what I did. Yeah. Uh, there was a whole, and still is a whole crew of people that build all these ideas that you come up with. But it's, it was the same as freelance illustration, except I was working for Macy's, where um, they had clients. We had to do preliminary drawings up to color presentations, and everything was a back and forth with a client, just like it is, as you know, with doing ad photography, anything, yep. and illustration. So in that respect, it was the same kind of thing. It was just a bunch of different parameters. A parade float has to fold out when it gets into New York. They come from New Jersey. They have to fold up, fit through Lincoln Tunnel, and then get assembled the night before. And the same with the balloons. They all come into New York City in uh, about 12 by 12 bins, mm -hmm. and they get inflated in the city and everything. So does that mean you get to go to the parade and check it out? Uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately we had to be part of the crew to set it up, oh, no. okay. which was a 22 hour day setting it up. I didn't like that part of it. I'm an artist, I just draw. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a great experience. 15 years worth of working for Macy's and a pension and all that kind of stuff which he didn't have as a freelancer, you know, so. And now I'm doing car art. And I had started with my interest in uh, vintage auto racing to get some t-shirt work, which I never really planned to do with my artwork, but I was asked to do a couple of t-shirt jobs. And that led me to car art, painting commissions of race cars, historic race cars, everything around cars, mainly racing cars. Commissions uh, from individuals, murals on the walls of people's places, and things like that. I used to do the shirt art actually for the NNL. Yeah. And the, the one that they have this year is one that they uh, reused and so forth that I did. Each year, like it's always been, there was a theme, you know, and a sub-theme and all that. And that was a year, I think it was the 50s and small cars or something like that. I'm looking forward to seeing your uh, the two models you've got. Well, hopefully, yeah, you go. as you know, Sometimes, like I said with the diorama, it's tough getting reference. I have black and white photos, but I don't have color on one car. And I'm loath to guess at it, even though yeah. I can take an educated guess, sure. but it's just, yeah. uh, I want to get it right, you know what I mean? I don't want to fake it anymore like I did with the diorama. 
Well, you know, you talk about my diorama and everything. Well, I got to give you your due. At that one, I think it may have been the second NNL that I was around the club with. You came with the D Daytona Charger. Did, I didn't know if I had shown that. Yeah, no, man. You brought that to the show, and that knocked the socks off everybody. And me being a circle track guy and drag racing, I mean, I was amazed at it, at the level of work that was into that piece. And, well, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I have to do an episode on that sometime. Yeah, you should. That was quite impressive, that at, especially at the time, the detail of it. I know you researched that thing. And as best I could, but I was looking at a restored car. Yeah. All I really had to go by for the close-ups were the car that sat in the museum that was what I felt was not an accurate representation of the cars that raced in the beginning. Yeah. In the spring, it was different than when oh, yeah, it got to the fall and then was restored with different graphics. Of course. So I, I mixed things a little bit. Yeah. That's, well, you know, that, that's always great, great cause for debates about things. Yeah. And I love to get into that too, because people would say that with my artwork. When I would do a painting of a piece, I try to research it was, how it was on a certain day or certain night at the races, yeah. and try and get the weather right, you know, unless the client wants something different. But get everything to fit that, and then paint the picture that is not an existing photograph, but a representation of that moment in time or whatever. So it's fun. It's part of the whole thing. It's fun. It's creative. It's what we love to yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you. Well, thank this you. It was awesome. It was Always wonderful. good to see you.